I just wanted to write something that felt like it hadn't been done before, and I wanted to merge a lot of strands of different kinds of writing I've done right. in various places. So, you know, for Filmmaker Magazine, I'm writing film criticism. Mm -hmm. The New Yorker, I might, like, cover the murder of a young black man by a University of Cincinnati police officer. Yeah. Over at the New Republic, I might, like, you know, write about, like, uh, the showing of old black movies from the 20s in a museum. At N plus one, I might interview Spike Lee and have him dodge all my questions. <laughs> you know, so I wanted to write a book that could encompass all of these all of these concerns right. with my own narrative of right. trying to make it in New York City, trying to make a, a life for myself in filmmaking, which is an industry that is dominated by wealth that requires great like it requ literally it's a it's a uh, energy and capital intensive. Uh, me, you you have to have the money to be able to, you know, pay a crew and a cast and right. insurance and anything. gear, right. and to move all of those people and things for right. forty fucking days and access to expensive spaces to make a movie. You're right. twenty, um, you know, I, that that's that's a province of um, of great capital. It's a place that great capital it must exist to do it, and ultimately, um, uh, you know, that's something that I haven't. Uh, and like I, I never really thought of as a, as a young person, like, mm -hmm. well, what does it, what, what is it going to require me to, to have access to the capital to make those things? Right. Um, and normally it requires like a good script mm -hmm. and like a, 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 a means of persuasion. Right. But often that means of persuasion is making people comfortable with who you are and what stories you're telling. Right. And the history of black cinema tells us that most of the really great black filmmakers in this country have struggled to maintain careers as narrative film directors. Absolutely. And that's a, a history I kind of erect in this book okay. while talking about Spike Lee okay. as being, you know, this like total anomaly in the history <laughs> of African American cinema. Yeah. To have at the studio level made personal work that spoke to topical issues right. almost every two years for 15 years. Without that he was working in the studio. The yeah. Time. From from 88 when he or 87 when he signs a deal to make school days. Right. His second film, his first studio film through uh, She Hate Me, mm -hmm. which is paid for by Sony, right. and is released by Sony Pictures Classics in like 2002, 2003. Right. That's 15 years where this guy just got to make movies about the black experience in a way that like no other African American director has before or since at the studio level consistently. Right. And um, so that's like a remarkable achievement. That deserves like mad props. Right. Um, I take issue with other aspects of Spike's work and, and, um, and public commentary about his work and what that work means so understand that. later on. But, um, so, you know, I, I, I think that that's something that given that this neighborhood I was coming of age in, uh, that's depicted in this book, mm -hmm. that change that, that I was observing, mm -hmm. um, is bound up at least in a lot of people's minds in the images that Spike Lee created in the eighties and nineties. Right. Um, it thought it was like appropriate to show this. Okay. You know? Very good. Very good. So, now, um, I know this is a loaded question, and I don't expect you to, to answer it in, in full, or at least um, to maybe even have an answer for me. But you know, when you sat down to write this book, you had an intention. Yeah. Your intention was to tell the story, you know, and hopefully uh, enlighten people on some of the perspectives that they may just be unaccustomed to, you know, outside of the outside of the, the earshot of, you know, of these perspectives. But um, with the with the book and the tour that accompanies, you know, you putting out the book, um, there has to there obviously was an intent intention to educate, sort of give context to your story and and other pieces of cinema, other important yeah. pieces of, of you know of, of black media that describes, in, if if not all parts of what you're describing. After it's all said and done, you know, or, 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 or when the, the book is in the hands of as many people's hands it'll be in, what sort of change do you hope it will inspire? Man, I don't, I, I, I would push back on that a little bit. I, I don't think this book is going to change much of anything yeah. in America, yeah. uh, in the hearts and minds of my readers. I think it will, it will move some people, anger others, mm -hmm. and perhaps enlighten the broad mass of people that read it about both my own experience and the history of this country and the history of this space. Right. There's a contentious space right now. Right. There's a fight. You used the term battleground earlier, mm -hmm. and like that size of battleground. Right. And I use the language of 
of war a lot. And you know, so does so are some of the people I examine in the book, like Jay Z's mm -hmm. memoir. Right. I sort of write about a lot, mm -hmm. and the, his vision of what bed, the bedside of his youth was, right, right. and how he essentially describes it as like a place of like combat, a yeah. place where like uh, these, outfitted like paramilitary units, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so. Um, Versus like a combat that's economic mm -hmm. and and um, ab about the control of spaces, which is what we're seeing now. Right. Um, the control of buildings and and sort of the soul of the neighborhood. What will be you know like will will you know will Bed Stuy be a majority black neighborhood thirty years from now as it was thirty years ago? Do you do you movie, feel like you know the answer to that question? I don't. You don't know the answer. I don't that know the answer to that question. Because, now, because now, when I talk to politicians that mm -hmm. rep Bed Stuy, like the young, ambitious African American, not uh, get new, jaded by politics. New, yeah, it's her first turn. You know, <laughs> like New York Assemblywoman who right. represents Bed Stuy. She's like, oh, it's no problem. It's all good. It's right. all good. And you know, she kind of acts like I'm like some know nothing outsider, right. and I act like she's just doing the bidding of the black upper class that's right. profiting from selling their brownstones. Right. You know, like. Right. And so there's like kind of a, there's a little tension there. Absolutely. You know, at a, an event we had in Bedside, actually the, op the first reading I did in Bedside, she was there. Right. And we had a little tete -a tete before, you know. It was yeah. like jovial, you know, but it was still. Yeah, but at the still, same time, you represent you know, two opposing camps almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that like, who are the people that, that form her base of support? Right. Are land owning black people who are engaged in politics. Right. People that are struggling to get by, they're being pushed out, they're trying to figure out how to keep their homes. Right. They're not like giving money to young assembly women who went to Princeton. So is so, you know? so, so, I so mean, is Bed Stuy gone forever? Is Oak Cliff as we once knew it gone forever? And then where do these pockets exist? Well, I, I think that people have to get organized and we have to get, have a vision of like how housing can be taken out of the profit making system mm -hmm. to a significant degree. Right. And that's a vision that most Americans are quite frankly just unwilling to support right now. Right. But, it's not capitalist. It's not American. But ultimately, like, look, evictions used to be a rare thing in this country until the rise of, like, property management as a profession, right. which happens, you know, in, like, the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask, like, go ask any 75-year-old person if they were a property manager when they were 30. Right. No. Right. You know, you won't find anybody who did that because for the most part, um, most apartments that are now being bought by these conglomerates, often with foreign money, mm -hmm. Or by, in Bed Stuy, quite frankly, a lot of Hasidic Jews, right. and that adds this whole racial element to you know contentiousness to the thing and right. like ethnic element. Um, you know, as I quote, like some some gentlemen of of uh, of that background who are profiled in a New York Magazine piece I, I reference in this book, mm -hmm. saying like, "Well, it's just my job to get the blacks out," wow. and I'm not racist. It's not like he's like you know. It's not like I'm like. I feel I don't like blacks. Right. It's just that like other people, other white people don't like blacks, and so they drive the pricing, the prices down. Right. And as soon as I can get all of them off a block or out of a building, I can I can raise the prices much more significantly. Right. But there's yeah, always yeah, going to be people that like there's always going to be people amongst the majority that don't want to live with some members of the minority. Wow. You know, and like so I have to thus eliminate all of them right. from this space in order to. I mean, that's you know the, and that's the most candid everybody. of these developers will tell you that. You know, you've seen over the Rhine, which was a neighborhood that was riven with, uh, with the largest American riots since the Rodney King riots of 1992. This is back in 2001. Okay. After the shooting of a 19-year-old black man named Timothy Thomas, right. shot in the back by a cop, Stephen Roach, four times. Uh, he had 15 outstanding parking tickets. He was fleeing over parking tickets, and he Got shot it. him in the back, unarmed, four times dead. And there was a massive riot in Cincinnati for like three days. It was like a, it was all over the national news. Yeah. And then 9/11 happened a few months later. Everybody forgot about it. Forgot about it. But in the aftermath of that, it was a collaborative agreement amongst the the black uh, uh, community groups uh, and and liberative groups, the Black United Front, um, and some others, and the police. And that collaborative agreement was like you know one of the first of its kind in the country, right? Okay. Meanwhile, the city fathers, mm -hmm. the Procter and Gamble's, the Western Southern Insurances, the Kroger's, right. Right. had seen the, the people who were managers in those spaces, executives mm -hmm. in those spaces, had seen their children leave, go to Chicago, mm -hmm. go to Detroit, go to New York City, go to L.A., go to, you know, anywhere where they felt like there was growth right. and where it was hip. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, how do we make Cincinnati hip again? And they're like, oh, let's all form a nonprofit that's paid for by these biggest for-profit for -profit corporations in town. 
and let's buy up all the property in that neighborhood where the riot was. Wow. And like give it to our sons and daughters. And that's exactly what's happening. And that's, wow. that's, and so it's like, a, it's a, it, you know, I talked about how often, you know, it's the state that's responsible because we're not giving people the resilience through housing subsidies, through vouchers right. uh, to, to stay in their homes. Most right. of the subsidies are going to rich people. Right. But, or people make $100,000, whether yeah. you think those people are rich or not. <laughs> and so what's happening in Cincinnati is the exact opposite. It's the city ceding authority mm -hmm. to third parties to, to basically plan the future of what is one of the great um, uh, architectural wonders right. of, of the Midwest right. the, over the Rhine neighbors. It's the largest collection of Italianate architecture, Italianate brownstones, anywhere in the country other than Greenwich Village in right. New York. Yeah. It's a beautiful neighborhood. And for a long time, there were 2,000 abandoned buildings. Mm -hmm. But you can go back and watch documentaries from the 70s set in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. where there's like young doctors trying to gentrify it then, wow. right in the 70s. And they're like much more candid about what they're doing than the people who represent 3CDC are today. Right. Those, you know, like Phil Ailman, the character in, in this, this film, mm -hmm. uh, We Will Not Be Moved, which okay. you can watch on Vimeo for free. I'll send it to you. Okay. And it's an interesting film because it's all stills. Mm -hmm. And then over the stills, they have recorded interviews. Right. You know, and right. it, it, you really can kind of like, uh, it's sort of, uh, it, it asks you to imagine what you're not seeing in a Absolutely. way that's like really stark. Absolutely. But anyway, in that, you know, he's buying up properties in Over the Rhine and in Mount Auburn, which is just above Over the Rhine, mm -hmm. in the hills of Cincinnati. And he's like, uh, you know, these Appalachians, some of them are just as dirty as the blacks. And we got to get them out too. And that neighborhood had been dominated by blacks and Appalachians living together, organizing together right. in the 50s and 60s in a way that, you know, counters our vision of what, you know, uh, intra working class solidarity amongst races can be like. Right. And ultimately it was the Appalachians who were peeled off in the 70s and 80s who bore the brunt of Phil, Phil Ellman and uh, Kathy Laker Schwab and these other uh, figures in Cincinnati's early gentrification, um, uh, and 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 you know it, it's been a massive, massive transformation that that neighborhood has seen in the last ten years since Three CDC formed and right. really started to get to work. Right. And now you know, just last week, the New York Times is like thirty six hours in Cincinnati. You know, like, and all the places they mention are like spots have opened the last three to five years right. in that strip of, gen and it's like Cincinnati's experiencing this renaissance. And none of that journalism is about, well, who's being displaced? And what are the consequences for that? Trace of a family that's been pushed from over the Rhine to the West End, which right. is poorer, which has less infrastructure, which has less access to jobs, et cetera. You know, like, or to the middle and working class neighborhoods of Cincinnati's African American population, like Avondale, mm -hmm. where my uh, mother currently lives, or Rosalind, those neighborhoods, Gulf Manor. That the, you know that journalism ex is existing. It's all like, oh, look at these nice restaurants where you can buy ten dollar, you know, yeah. hot dogs. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I think that there's a societal cost to this that we're not acknowledging, and that um, and that it's again a continuation of plunder, if you will, to use the Coates term. Or, right. Um, you know, we could probably come up with some other terms. You know, some synonyms. But um, yeah. I've been trying to wrap my head around that for a long time, man. I think that's why I wrote the book, was just trying to figure out what I knew 